Um, uh, also want to welcome back Charles and Peter. Uh, great to see the two of you, and you're both looking pretty darn good to us. So, uh, well, welcome back, and uh, hopefully all the treatments have gone well, and uh, things are uh, all positive for you. Um, Thank you. Uh, we want to do uh, our uh, happy notes, and um, uh, just uh, anybody got a happy note? Hang on, uh, more people coming in, but why is the waiting room not letting me in there? I, I have one one last bit about Saturday. Um, yeah. uh, we have we have just almost a perfectly even number. And and uh, but I would love to have a couple of, of recruits uh, in reserve, uh, just in case somebody cancels at the last minute and uh, and, and leaves a, a team short. So any anybody that uh, would like to, to volunteer for not not a direct assignment, but a but a, a, a short notice assignment on on Saturday, I, I'd really like to hear from you. Okay. Um. Anybody else with a happy note? Jennifer, please. I, <clears throat> we listened to the uh, Toronto Rotary uh, uh, speech on, on Friday, their club meeting on Friday. And I just want you to know that they had as many technical problems or more than we have. So, <laughs> <laughs> not alone. Mm -hmm. Sorry? We're not alone. We're not alone. No, just, actually, it was worse than. I ever ever seen anything so <laughs> <laughs> make you feel good yes it does okay i think i had somebody in the waiting room but they're not popping in yeah on the I'm, I'm waiting to andy andy go ahead please okay a couple of things for happy notes uh uh, a month ago i had one of my eyes done for a cataract and yesterday i had the other one done so Today I'm seeing very clearly, and I don't have any glasses. A little fuzzy on the on the one, but uh, that's got cleared up, so that's good news. And uh, we got an email today that uh, actually my uh, grandson in British Columbia is engaged and getting married in February. And of course, it's a small wedding; we won't be able to go. But that's the first grandson, and for me to get to, to take the plunge. <laughs> Wonderful. Peter, I have a question. Um, I'm trying to get to the waiting room to let some people in, but I'm it's not popping up on my screen. Oh, here we go. I think I got it. You hit enough buttons, things might work out. <laughs> Hang on, I just have to make sure I get my attendance taken care of as well. And we're going to welcome uh, a few more into the fold here. And uh, we are into happy notes. Uh, and Allison, I asked you earlier if uh, you if uh, you could mention your <coughs> note to us. Okay. Um, so we we're tallying up the pizza for polio amount, and we're just waiting on. I didn't have Paisano's number, Brett. I know. I think you picked that up. If you remember offhand, if you don't, that's fine. We don't need to know this very second. But I think somebody else had picked up two, and I don't think I have those yet. Okay, no problem. Well, that's that's good. That means there's even more money to add to the tally. But we, with two outstanding numbers, we're already at two thousand four hundred and twenty dollars. Oh, All right, <laughs> very good year. Yeah. So that's um, that's great for a pandemic, <laughs> all things considered, and. Uh, Everyone was very, very happy. Most of them said that they doubled what they did last year. So it's a great okay. event. And I think everyone, and I'll, I think we'll have all the numbers by next week meeting. So I'll make sure to have another tally because it'll be even more than that next week. Okay. Um, uh, Karen McDonald, did you have any checks on the pizza for uh, polio? <clears throat> no, I don't, Brett. I gave it, I gave you that one. Okay. I brought that one in. That was all I had. Okay. And I probably haven't gone back and looked at it because I wasn't adding anything more to that pot just yet. So I'll, I'll yeah, go. Yeah, I know the substantial one. 
Yeah, there, there were some good ones there. So yeah. uh, I'll let you know, Allison, I'll double check my uh, list that I've got at the office there and, uh, and let you know for sure how we're doing. Um, I, don't yeah. have, I don't have video, but uh, did you want to talk about the 300 show last night? Uh, yes, go ahead, Les. Uh, well, we had our 300th show and uh, uh, everything went well. It was um, another milestone. Uh, we are getting good uh, sales. You can tell by uh, by the number of respondents that we're getting. We had how many winners last night? Were they uh, just, just five. We, we uh, split on um, one game. And all the other ones were straight up winners. Yeah. Yeah. And the response shows that we're getting, uh, we're what, over a, a thousand now consistently. And, uh, yeah, I think we've actually hit about over 1,100 on a few weeks as well. Yeah, so uh, things are looking good. It, it's going very well. We, um, uh, we were supposed to have cake last night, but the local bakery handed our cake out to somebody else. Huh. So uh, the um, Kojiko was uh, providing us with a cake and instead they had to run and get us some donuts, which we took care of those too. So uh, maybe we'll have that <laughs> cake next week. Who knows? <laughs> um, I think I work next week. So cake would, would be good. Okay. <laughs> Our host. And Rick, Rick's trying to say something, but I can never quite understand what that oh, means. Oh. Oh, he's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. He, he's going to redo something there. <laughs> oh, 60. Oh, 60K. I got you, Rick. So at the current rate, um, a year's worth of sales, maybe during the this rotary year, um, a year's worth of profit net, or sorry, profit gross, uh, could be $60,000, which is kind of the area we've been wanting to get to for a long time. So you got uh, all of that out of, out of that, that, that piece of cardboard. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> see. I can, I can read. I can read <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick thinks net, I think grow. So we'll have to wait and see, <laughs> but, uh, the sales have been, uh, very good. So, uh, we, we thank everybody for the uh, work that uh, goes on, uh, with the uh, with the bingo, it's uh, um, it, it's a trying time right now. A lot of our people want to play, and um, if we've got anybody delivering that's feeling a little uncomfortable, let us know. Um, you know, we want to make sure that you're comfortable with whatever. So if we need to find somebody else, uh, we'll certainly uh, work to uh, to that uh, side of things. Um, so at this time. Um, I did have a report somewhere, but I, I got home late, uh, had a couple of last buckets came in and I always like to get the uh, money all put together uh, before I leave the office. So I'll apologize. I'll, I'll make sure next week if I've got any uh, birthdays and anniversaries, I'll get those out to you. Um, I'm, uh, Peter has some information uh, with regard to uh, uh, Guatemala. So we'll ask Peter if he would uh, come forward. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've been, had several meetings with the uh, Southern Alberta International Service Committee, um, both the, Ro the Rotary District in Southern Alberta, centered in Calgary. I've had two meetings with their uh, one that's sort of a general International Service Committee meeting. The other one was their Guatemala Focus meeting. And so I'm now in discussions with four different clubs in Southern Alberta uh, to get them involved in the uh, the Rachel project in, in Pay 10 in Northeast Guatemala. Um, because of a couple of things that, that may have, that this will affect the project. One is the way that their district works. You can't apply for district funding, which is crucial because it's district funding which triggers rotary funding. Um, you can't apply until April 1st. So we may postpone um, submitting the project proposal until uh, around the beginning of May, which shouldn't really affect things because given COVID, I don't think we can do any rollout of the Rachel systems until February, 2022. Um, so this, the, the timing won't, the eventual timing of the rollout won't be changed. But more importantly, um, 
Oh, one of the people that I've met in this, these meetings is uh, Danielle Skogan, a young woman who started up a program uh, for empowerment of girls in Guatemala. And uh, they've put together a whole bunch of course material. Um, so we've set up a meeting. All, we've already had a meeting with her and the Rachel, the people who are responsible for Rachel, trying to get the course material onto the Rachel system. And then next Thursday, we're going to have a meeting with her and the Pay 10 Rotary Club people um, to try and basically uh, up change or, or, or add this Ser Nina to be a girl uh, um, sort of gender equality training, uh, confidence, courage training, which is really important for, for young women and, and, um, and young girls in, in Guatemala. Uh, trying to get this as part of the of our of our um, uh, project, uh, the P Ten project. So not only would there be uh, Sarah Nina material on the Rachel system available to all the students, but we would be training the teachers to be able to present that material uh, to the girls and the boys. Um, so this is a slight change in direction. It'll require some rewriting of the uh, grant, but I think it makes the grant a lot stronger. If anyone in our club is interested in participating in that meeting a week Thursday at 4 p.m. our time, uh, let me know, because um, it, it, it seems like an interesting and exciting extension to the uh, project. Um, so anyway, that's my uh, information on how things are going. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, so um, I think as far as the club level goes, we really um, like to do whatever we can for Guatemala. Uh, Peter had mentioned that uh, the last um, storm system that went through was rather difficult for Guatemala. So something the club might want to think about uh, maybe trying to do a, something in, in that regards. Um, so just put that on the uh, on the shelf for now but um, we really appreciate yeah I can say it. a little bit about that because I was speaking to Lusani Contreras who is the person from the Pay 10 Club with whom I've been working on the project and she had spent a couple of days in a place called Las Cruces in Pay 10 uh, province uh, totally flooded 180 families uh, uh, not in their homes, I mean, they have to leave their homes, their flow homes are flooded. Uh, she sent me some photographs um, and, and you just see the water level sort of halfway up the doorways of, the, of these houses. Um, and even once the water goes away, which they think will take about two weeks, unless they get more rain from the current hurricane, um, and then they have to wait 20 days for things to dry out properly before they're allowed to go back uh, to their homes. So, um, a way of, of providing aid would be if, if, if uh, we wanted to, you know, make a donation to, to their clubs directly because that then it would, you know, get rid of middlemen and go, and go straight to the people who are helping them out. Uh, I, I'll put um, some of the photos and some videos on a OneDrive site so people can look at them if they like and I'll send a note around um, because the video in particular, you see these people, the rotary, yellow rotary t-shirts going around helping with the, uh, the camps that they've set up to, to uh, they're just tarpaulins sort of hooked over trees that, that people are living under. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, one other thing with regard to the uh, gift, uh, we have these lovely t-shirts that have the gift, sorry, rotary and the gift uh, on them. And uh, they're of the size that hopefully will go over our outerwear so that on uh, Saturday when we're out uh, going through the neighborhoods uh, that uh, we're going to be going through, we can be identified. Uh, so our Rotarians and, and family, uh, we've got enough shirts for them. We also have about 20 other volunteers coming in to uh, help us out with the uh, collection at that time. So uh, um, if you are going out, we'll have the shirt we'll have that, um, uh, with us. And um, if you want to stop by the Rotary office, uh, the shirts are um, there and available as well. So I think I've muted pretty much everybody. Yes? Um, it's Tracy. I'm going to be at the Bradley Center uh, taking in everything from Good. everybody who's delivering. So I'll... 
Yeah, to that. Do you want a shirt, Tracy? Yeah, that'll work. Okay, can you stop by the office or um, can I drop it off can at I a bank off? or? No, I it? can go by the office. I got to go to the office on Wednesday, tomorrow anyway, so. Okay, uh, I'll okay. be there from nine until 12, if that works. Okay. Okay, See, we'll see you then. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to ask if uh, Peter would do a bit of an introduction for us. And uh, hopefully, Jim, you're uh, quite comfortable with this uh, method. And um, well, we'll it's, 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 a, it's going to be an experiment for me. This is the first time I've actually done a presentation on Zoom. So, but I tried it out with Peter. So we'll see how it works. Okay. Okay, it's, it's my, my pleasure to introduce Jim Burant. Um, Jim and I actually were in high school together um, and but have known each other for a long time, uh, obviously, because <laughs> since high school was 50, friggin' 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Jim uh, got his honors and master's in Canadian studies with specialization in art history. Yeah, that was always weird to us, guys, someone going into art history. Um, he went to Carleton and, and basically since then he's worked at a library and archives Canada, what we always knew as sort of the National Library or the National Archives, um, and in various capacities including art and photography archives. Um, from 1976 until his retirement in 2011. He's published and lectured widely on art and photography and archives in Canada and abroad. And he's been the curator for numerous, numerous ex exhibitions and has an international reputation in the fields of art history and archives. He received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal in 2003. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Let's see, I'm gonna put the share screen on. And here we go. There, does everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm trying to get it up into... All right, well, if you can see that, I'm gonna start from here. Um, as Peter said, um, I worked for 35 years for Library and Archives Canada, and uh, here is, um, it's the Archives of the Government of Canada. It's the largest archival institution in the country. Um, uh, picture on the left is actually the headquarters building of Library and Archives Canada, which is about four blocks west of Parliament Hill on Wellington Street. Um, it also has a Preservation Center, which is out in Gatineau, and uh, I'll show you another picture of it later. The archives has been around since 1872. The National Library, which with which it was amalgamated in 2004, has been around since 1953. Um, the Dominion Archivist in 1925 noted that archives are a gift of one generation to another, and the extent of our care for them marks the extent of our civilization. Uh, something that um, I always loved as a quote. Um, the archives has a twofold mission to maintain and collect the official archives of the Government of Canada and to acquire private records from thousands of eminent Canadians and organizations of national significance. And I looked it up before I prepared this talk and noted that such Chatham related figures as Judy LaMarche, Richard Doyle, Augustus Bridal, Ray Monroe, and June Colwood, all of whom are um, lived or at one time was associated with Chatham, all of their collections are at Library and Archives Canada. And also of note that the archives of Daniel Hill, who founded the Black History Society of Ontario, are also at LIC and contains a great deal of reference material related to the Underground Railroad. Uh, very few people know this, but the art collection at LAC is the largest in Canada, more than 450,000 works, including oil paintings, watercolors, drawings, political cartoons, posters, costume designs, medals and medallic objects, um, heraldry and ephemeral items, 
buttons, pins, postcards, crests, Christmas cards, you name it. Just to take an example, um, uh, I'm going to show you paintings, drawings, prints, some of which are related to the Chatham region and otherwise just very generally. Um, we always felt that visual documents added to our understanding of the past, portrait of an individual like this portrait of General Brock, the record of an event taken on the spot or created afterwards, the depiction of a site or a place over time, and the painting in the lower right is actually of Goderich, Ontario, uh, looking out on Lake Huron, from 1840. Uh, it can be a record of an everyday activity, an object of propaganda or reward, or in some cases, the only record of a lost race. There's the archives owns a portrait of Demas DeWitt, the last surviving Beatuk Indian uh, who died in 1829. Um, thousands of drawings, some of which are, here are some examples here, including the first steamboat on, on St. Lawrence, um, a sleigh club meeting in London, Ontario, um, someone returning from the hunt. Watercolors, um, the one on the upper right, is everybody, I'm hoping everybody's on from 1820. Um, on the left, two Indian chiefs on Bois Blanc Island in uh, the Detroit River, a view of um, a railway bridge over the Grand River, um, and uh, obviously a pioneer view. Prints, lots of different prints. Um, the most relevant one for Southern Ontario is the one in the lower right, a view of the 1881 uh, steamboat tragedy on the Thames River that where more than 300 people drowned, surprisingly enough, on a Sunday excursion in the summer of 1881. But also views of pioneer settlement, portraits of individuals. This, is, this happens to be, um, oh, what is his name? Colonel Talbot. Um, uh, portraits of native warriors, Sir George Prevost, the Governor General of Canada. Postcards. Um, postcards, posters, um, Christmas cards, um, stamp designs, advertisements. Um, the archives has a huge variety of, of um, objects of this or in this type. Metals and metallic advice, uh, devices. Um, the archives is a repository of all canceled great seals of Canada. And the one up in the upper left is Queen Victoria. Um, medals. Um, we have a Victoria Cross. We also have copies of almost every Indian treaty medal that was ever handed out. Political buttons, you can see an old 19th century one, a newer one, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau from 1968. Caricatures and political cartoons. Um, we at, for a period of time, I ran something called the National Canadian Museum of Caricature, and we collected the original cartoons of all of those political cartoons you see in newspapers. Um, and uh, for Southern Ontario, we, for example, we have Mike Graston's collection of political cartoons. But we have historical cartoons, such as the two upper ones. Um, uh, we have the Duncan McPherson collection from the Toronto Star, including this wonderful image of Pierre Trudeau in 1968, The State is Me, and we have the entire collection of For Better or For Worse. So these are the original drawings for that cartoon collection. We're the repository of the National Heraldry Collection, uh, which not only includes coats of arms, such as coats of arms of Canada, but also of um, all the designs from flag competitions. Um, and this one on the right that I'm showing you is actually the design that was submitted by A.Y. Jackson in 1964, but not chosen. As I say, it's the largest collection in the world and I was in charge of the collection for more than two decades and almost everybody who saw the collection said, why is all this stuff in the archives? Why isn't it in the National Gallery? Um, and my answer to that always was that we collected, the archives collected images 
not because who they were done by or because it presented a, an aesthetic style, but because of the content of the image. So, um, and you can see in the lower image that the archives used to have these wonderful display rooms where you could look at the visual history of the country. And in the upper picture, I'm pulling out a rack of paintings and these are all by Cornelius Kriegoff. Um, and Kriegoff's paintings, no art gallery actually acquired Kriegoff paintings before 1940. Um, up until then, he was just considered to be a hack painter who recorded scenes of Quebec life. So the archives acquired many of them and still has the largest collection of Kriegoffs in the world, uh, other than the Art Gallery of Ontario. We acquire the collection three different ways. Material gets uh, transferred, we, LAC, uh, gets material transferred from government departments, posters, medals, philatelic material. Uh, people donate their material on its own or as part of their archives. And finally, the archives has a small acquisition budget, which has been augmented since 1977 by grants from the Cultural Property Export and Review Board. Where's the collection stored? This big preservation center, which looks like an aircraft hangar, houses 48 vaults, which can withstand a nuclear explosion and um, seven or eight of the vaults contain the art collection. So there's a view of um, one vault on the left, um, the, the drawings vault, and on the lower right, the paintings vault. Back to my question about why this art is in the archives, not in the National Gallery. Um, aesthetic considerations change. These four paintings are among the most famous paintings owned by the archives. They were acquired in 1922. They, they're by a woman artist named Frances Anna Hopkins. Um, when they were acquired, um, the National Gallery had virtually no works by women artists, nor was Frances Anna Hopkins considered to be part of the mainstream of Canadian art in this country. But in the 1970s, as interest in studying the history of women artists began, uh, she began to achieve a greater importance. In 1975, there was a major exhibition of women artists and 75% of all of the works in that show were from the, from the archives. Um, partly because we collected the work of women artists, not because they presented part of an artistic canon, but because of what they were representing. Another example is this example of a woman named Mary Ryder Hamilton, who was an unofficial First World War artist. She wasn't allowed to go because they didn't send women to the First World War um, battlefields. In 1919, she went her, all by herself on her own dime, um, although sponsored by the BC Legion, um, and painted scenes of the battlefields in France. She eventually painted 250 works, came back to Canada, offered them to the National Gallery. The National Gallery said, no, we're not interested. So they ended up at the archives. And in 1984, we created an exhibition of her work uh, for Remembrance Day. And that, that exhibition has never been out of circulation since. It's been to museums all over the world. Um, and this, the work on the upper right, the poppies in the dugouts on the Somme, um, has been reproduced as a stamp. It gets used on Remembrance Day ceremony, ceremony occasions everywhere. Anyway, so that gives you an idea about how these things work, um, why the archives acquires what it does and, and um, how things have changed. And just as an example, um, these four Francis Ann Hopkins paintings, the one in the lower right, Canoe Shooting the Rapids, is actually now on display at the National Gallery. Um, we also acquire works by artists who aren't considered to be important artistically, but who document can the Canadian scene. This English artist, Edward Roper, who lived very briefly in Hamilton, um, came to Canada in 1887, crossed the entire country, painted several hundred paintings. And in 1989, we were fortunate enough to purchase that collection. And there are scenes right across Canada. And you can see by the content 
that they're very information filled. We also have a lot of works by British military artists. Um, uh, this particular work by um, Lieutenant James Peachy was painted in 1784, and it actually shows uh, an encampment of loyalists who'd arrived in Upper Canada in Cornwall, Johnstown at the time. Um, and this is probably the earliest view of um, Upper Canada that we have. Other military artists documented other aspects of pioneer life. James Patterson Coburn, for example, um, the view of the road between Kingston and York, which looks a lot different than the main road between Kingston and York now. Uh, um, also did views of Montreal, Toronto, Montreal, uh, Quebec, Toronto, Ottawa. There are hundreds of James Patterson Coburn works in the archives, and they're all very similar to these. For Southwestern Ontario, I, I, I really love the work of this artist, uh, Royal Engineer Philip John Bainbrake. Some of you may have seen these works in, um, there was a show in Chatham uh, of historical Chatham, and I can't remember the reference exactly, but Bainbrake's works were included in that show. Uh, so the one on the left is Moravian Town on the Thames in 1842. Bainbrake was actually stationed in Chatham for a number of years. The one on the right is um, shows the density of the bush in southwestern Ontario in 1840, um, the buttonwood tree in the bush near Chatham. Um, lovely image of pioneer life. Um, he documented, because he was a royal engineer, he documented roads and travel in Upper Canada. So there's a view of a steamboat approaching Amherstburg in 1842. And Bainbrick's view of the barracks at Chatham you know, in 1840. So I love this view, very nicely done. I, I don't have any comparables to where it is today. Um, and I should look for that. Um, I always use these two particular images of Bainbridge to talk about pioneer life in Upper Canada. Um, the one on the left showing a bush road as the, the settlers, you know, come, they build their log cabin, they start clearing the woods. And um, then there's a second view in summer, a bush road, a, a bush farm near Chatham in 1842. And you can see the, the a clearing has been made, uh, um, split rail fences, um, the uh, uh, crops have been uh, sown in between the stumps. You've got a corduroy road. It's a, it's a lovely image. In addition, um, the archives documents history in a more general way. So, you know, almost any Canadian history book is going to be illustrated with views from Library and Archives Canada. Just as an example, um, we have prints of the Battle of um, Put-in Bay at Lake, on Lake Erie and the Battle of the Thames uh, at which Tecumseh was killed. And one of the few Monuments to, to come see is in Longwoods in southwestern Ontario. Um, very specifically for the Chatham region, I noted that we have posters relating to um, the Underground Railway and fugitive slaves coming to Canada. Um, we also hold the King Illustrated News, which includes images such as the view on the top a view of Petrolia, the oil wells of Petrolia in 1871, and the view in the bottom is actually a view of Chatham, um, which was published in 1882. Um, the art collection is mostly pre-1900, although you, you could see from my examples earlier that there are posters, postcards, um, um, medals, etc. Um, I told Peter I could probably do a whole other talk about the photography collection because Library and Archives Canada has 30 million photographs of Canada. So, um, but it, I only have so much time. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to say LAC provides public access to its holdings. It has a, one of the most used websites in the federal government. 
uh, www.bac-lac.gc.ca. Um, there are research tools available on that. There's just detailed descriptions. There are large scale digitization efforts going on. Um, if we weren't in the COVID times, uh, you could go and visit. LAC and carry out research on the premises. There are research specialists on hand, and you can get reproductions that are available, uh, reproductions of almost anything that the archives owns at a fairly reasonable cost. LAC also organizes exhibitions, arranges special tours to groups and distinguished visitors. Um, the view on the lower right shows uh, an exhibition that I organized in 2008 which was on display in Quebec City. And I was proud to be able to welcome the Governor General, Michael Jean, and her husband. And on the upper left, um, this is a pretty fun one. Um, the King and Queen of Sweden came to Canada in 2009. And I was, I was asked to pull out material relating to Swedish settlement in Canada, and I got to take them on a tour. It was a fun thing to do. I'll just finish off by noting that LAC belongs to the nation, it's there to serve you. Um, it loans hundreds of works annually to exhibitions, it circulates its own exhibitions, it makes hundreds of thousands of images available, um, described online as well as about 90,000 which are actually accessible visually. Um, it also does create artist files, um, probably the most comprehensive list of artists in Canada. It works with scholarly communities and answers thousands of questions from the broader public annually. I, uh, I loved working for LAC and uh, I still maintain my contacts with people there and I still work with the collection on a variety of projects. So um, if you ever get the chance, go and visit LAC and or visit the website and see what you can find. So that's that's my presentation. Um, I don't know um, whether or not if people want to ask questions, you can ask Peter for my email address and I'd be happy to answer any questions if people have very specific questions about the presentation. Do you have time for a few questions now if anyone has questions, uh, Jim? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. If people want to ask okay. a question. All right. Um, if you can uh, stop sharing the screen. Not sure how you do that. Uh, I'll figure that one out. The little green thing at the top of the screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I see it. There, there I am. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, now I can see everybody as well. So uh, is there uh, any questions that we'd like to uh, present? Uh, Allison, I was hoping you'd have something. That was a great presentation, Jim, thank you. I worked at the uh, Archives of Ontario for several years, so in Toronto. So this is lots, lots of great information for me to learn about what's happening in Ottawa. Uh, the importance of archives what would be one of your favorite items in the collection? Can you narrow it down? Well, I always loved uh, the Francis Ann Hopkins. Um, <laughs> one of the things I did during COVID times was I actually on Facebook posted, did 80 separate postings of my favorite works from LAC's collections. So I eventually added up how many I, I posted 700 images <laughs> and talked about them during from March until June um, and then sort of stopped when the weather got good. But uh, there are two of my favorite images. Um, there's a lovely 1819 view, a watercolor, which is about the size like like this big, it's it's very small, like four by six, which is a view of the Laloche Portage in, in northwestern Saskatchewan. And it's a 36 mile portage between uh, uh, the Clearwater River and Lac Laloche. And it was used by the fur traders. And it's done by a British artist named George Back. And it's an extraordinary little watercolor. It was my favorite work in the whole collection. I, I loved it immensely. 
Um, I also mentioned um, the there's a a miniature portrait that is a, a small scale uh, ivory on um, um, watercolor on ivory portrait of a Biotok woman named Damasdewit. And I always loved the portrait. It was done in 1829. She was um, the last living Biotok Indian. Uh, as I'm not sure how many people know, but uh, settlers actually destroyed an entire uh, community the Beatuck in Newfoundland, and she was the last survivor. She was brought to St. John's Newfoundland, and the wife of the Lieutenant Governor did a portrait of her, and they were going to try and um, return her to, to the territory where she lived, but she died of tuberculosis um, in St. John's, and um, thereafter nobody could find any any re remain, remaining Beatuck. So she's considered the last Beatuck. And that was one of my favorite images because it was so unique and it's the only um, from life portrait of a Beatuck Indian as well. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, this is a treasure. This is a world treasure, you know, um, a whole race of, in of people wiped out and this is the only physical manifestation of them. Um, other than archaeological remains. So those were my two favorite things. Thanks. I might have to add you on Facebook so I can see all of your favorites. <laughs> all 800 of your out. posts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, uh, Janet. Whoops, are you unmuted? Oh, there I am. Thank you. Thank that was a wonderful presentation. I'm a huge fan of the documentary, The Curse of Oak Island. And uh, so I just wondered in the archives, is there much about the uh, searches and the history of Oak Island? Uh, not, not that I know of, to be honest. Um, you know, obviously the archives owns um, I, in addition to um, um, art and photography, there's enormous map collection. And so anybody who's doing searches on Oak Island would be using admiralty charts and um, more um, uh, localized survey maps. Uh, the British Navy patrolled and there are log books uh, in the archives relating to patrols of the Nova Scotia shore. Um, there would likely have been, I mean, you know, all of the Oak Island mystery is relating to piracy and um, the records of the Admiralty Court um, in Halifax um, mm -hmm. might yield things. I'm, I'm not sure how much research was done with that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else there might be. Uh, there's probably film. Uh, because the Oak Island mystery is something that's been going on for many decades. Uh, and I think the film board, the National Film Board, might have done something back in the 50s. Okay. Thank anyway. You. Uh, Jim, how long are you, were you at LAC? Uh, I started as a summer student when I was 19. So I worked there. Including you never my really student. left. Yeah, exactly. It was... <laughs> I discovered um, how much I loved the job. I, they hired me back for two further summers and then um, I went back to grad school and I was fortunate that they um, hired me in, in the summer of 1976 and um, I, I loved it quite, quite a lot. It was, it was like a dream job. And um, when, <laughs> the funny part about it is that when I used to give tours to people, um, people would always afterwards come up to me and say, you've got the best job in the government of Canada. And I said, yeah, I feel pretty lucky. You know, um, not only was I able to work with this enormous collection, but I had some say in, in, in how to build it, how to build the collection. And in fact, um, during my time as the manager of the, well, the director of the collection, um, the collection tripled in size. So um, it was it was a great experience, uh, and it's thirty eight years. So 
Uh, you, you showed one slide then of that huge building with all the vaults inside. Yes. Um, so did you, uh, in the position you were at when that was built, did you have a lot to do with uh, the design and, and uh, setting up the vaults and, and all of that? Um, I had some input. There is a whole other area within archives. And um, actually, uh, one of my staff members went over to the project um, in 1993. So yeah, I did have a, a, a say in, in how the building was built. Um, oh yeah, the, <laughs> I should have mentioned this. Um, the the Gatineau Preservation Center was conceived in 1988 and it was opened in 1997. And as far as I know, it's the only building built by the federal government ever, um, well, in the modern era, that came in under budget. It, it, was, it was budgeted to cost $80 million and it only cost $70 million. So um, it was probably the only, only project you'll ever find um, that, that came in under budget. And in fact, um, it was designed to last for 20 years and it got filled up in 20 years. So they're actually building a second building behind it. The other thing that's great about the building is that um, the, the power plant, that is all of the electrical and air conditioning um, 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 equipment was built in a separate building outside with a specific idea in mind that when they needed a new building, they didn't have to completely replicate everything, but they just had to build another building um, beside it. And that's what they're doing. So um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, people complain about how much government costs, but in that case, the archives did a terrific job in, in picking an architect and designing a building that came in under budget. I, I thought it was a great achievement that nobody ever heard of. Great. Um, anyone else have questions? I've still got another one or two here. <laughs> um, so it, now you mentioned there's also a lot of uh, photography uh, as well. So in your job, were you working a lot with the photography side of things? Yes, I was in charge of the photography side for the last 13 years of my career. Um, and um, that was a terrific experience as well. I, I actually started out as a photo reference archivist. Um, and um, one of the great things about that was I was able to go into the storage um, facilities, like go into the vaults. And anytime I was looking up something, I just go into the vault and I open up boxes and I did get to look at, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of photographs at a time. Um, in fact, my very first job was, was going to the National Film Board Phototech and um, going through their card catalog. And I pulled 300,000 cards out of their card catalog in the summer of 1972 um, and because um, they were transferring all of their historical photographs to, to the archives. And um, one of the... One <laughs> One of the, the, the reasons why I love archives so much is I was going through the card catalog and I was looking and looking and looking and pulling cards. And I came across a series of National Film Board photographs that were taken in 1957 um, at, in Golden Lake, Ontario, which is where the Golden Lake Indian Reserve is. And there, it was a story about a big um, a freighter canoe, a bridge park canoe that had been built specifically for the Canadian Museum of History by a man named Matt Bernard. Now it just so happens that Matt Bernard, um, the master canoe builder, is my great uncle. Um, he, um, and I saw this picture as part of this sequence and it was a picture showing a woman holding a little boy, little boy's hand as the canoe is being launched. And I said, hey, that's interesting. That looks like my mother. And I realized it was my mother <laughs> and the little boy was me. And I thought to myself, wow, what a great, you know, like here I am, I'm part of history. And that really touched me. It was, it was, it was a very interesting moment. And, and, and what year was that? that? Pardon? What year was that? It was 1957. So, oh, wow. so I was five years old. I mean, I looked at the little boy and I said, gee, that little boy looks around five. 
Ah, that would be the same name as me. Wait, that is me. <laughs> so it was funny. And I later then asked my mother about it and she pulled out her own photo album where she had her own photograph taken at the same time, but from a different angle, showing me and her and the canoe. So it was interesting to realize that yes, you are part of history. And no doubt if somebody went through the National Film Board photo catalog, they'd find tons of photos of Chatham too because the film board would send out their photographers to do these photo stories all across Canada. So it was a great education. And it was also fun to work with photographers over the last 13 years of my career to, you know, talk to them about donating their collections and to deal with some of the great photographers in Canadian history. You know, Joseph Karsh, for example, who I met many times before he passed away and, um, George Hunter, uh, Richard Harrington. I, I, I met tons of great photographers uh, during my career. Oh, that's great. Okay, I don't see any other hands waving. Oh, Peter's got a question. Uh, actually, just a comment. Um, since I can see the gallery too while you were doing the uh, uh, your talk, I could see that quite often people were going really up close to their screens to to watch uh, your. Your, your slides, Jim. And so um, what I'm going to do, if, if you're okay with it, I'm going to put the your slides, because I've got a copy of them, onto OneDrive so people can go, go back and actually look at them on their, uh, you know, the biggest screen that they have um, and, 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 you know, blow it up and look closely. Um, and uh, we're also, as, as you know, we're going to be recording this and we're going to uh, make it available on YouTube uh, for, the, for the club to look at. Sure, that's that's fine by me. I mean, you know, um, like I say, I, I love uh, talking about these images and making people aware of them. And uh, I know that I went through them fairly quickly because I didn't want to take up all your day's time with this. So, I think everyone appreciated it very, very much. Thank you. Well, oh, most definitely, welcome. Jim. Really appreciate it, and uh, and I'm I, I like photography, so I'm thinking, well, maybe in 2021 we can get you back with a little photography uh, uh, information as well. Oh, I'd, uh, I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Super. Um, I, you did have one slide of uh, Chatham that was looking out uh, and down the river, and I'm I'm pretty sure Tony and Jennifer live at, at that spot. You know, I could just sort of see that from their backyard. And, um, you know, it, it just sort of made me think of, uh, yeah, that, you know, that, that definitely could be uh, right in the, the neighborhood where, uh, where they live. So uh, uh, we want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time and oh. for uh, uh, all of those that uh, were able to get out. I want to say a special hello to uh, Ashley. Uh, she's been able to uh, join us and I think I have it set up so that I can make sure she gets the emails. Ashley is one of our uh, honorary Rotarian. So, um, hello to Ashley, and uh, hello, everyone. nice to nice to hear from you. Yes. Everybody wants to say hello. And, P and Peter as well. Peter Cooks on the call. We were very happy to have Peter. See you, yeah. Pete. We got you in a little bit later, so we had a quick discussion with Peter and with Charles. Oh, good. And very glad to hear that the gentlemen are uh, doing doing pretty well at this point. So uh, I'm going to ask Julia if you would uh, do us the honors of O Canada, please.
Thank you, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Uh, there is going to be a little presentation um, with the uh, youth mental health afterwards or a little uh, discussion. So uh, to the rest of you, uh, we'll see you around. Uh, see some of you on uh, Saturday for the gift. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you.